everyone. Glad everybody can see us. <laughs> okay, I was setting up our our live stream on Facebook. Um, but I want to welcome you to our shelter series event. Um, my name is Clarissa Goodlett, and I'm the communications director at Preservation North Carolina. And during this time when sheltering has become a central part of our lives, we wanted to create a space uh, to con connect with you to explore the culture, architecture, diversity, and stories of the many uh, buildings and houses that serve as shelters across our state. Uh, this is one of several events that we've done previously and that we have scheduled for the year. And registration is open um, for our upcoming events and you can register uh, or find out about them at preservationnc.org. Uh, this afternoon, we are excited to present Baldhead Island, Preserving Four Centuries of Shelter, presented by Travis Gilbert. Travis is the Education and Collections Coordinator at the Old Baldy Foundation. Gilbert received a Bachelor's of Arts in History um, from Hood College in Frederick, Maryland. He is a former manager of the Lower Cape Fear Historical Society and serves on the board of directors at the Historic Wilmington Foundation, Southport Historical Society, and Thalian Hall Center for, for the Performing Arts. Uh, Gilbert is a resident of Wilmington's Historic District. And so before I turn it over to Travis, I wanted to just quickly go over a few uh, webinar FYIs um, for those of you who might be new to this platform um, or newish to our shelter series. So let me try to do a share screen here. Uh, all right, so um, as you all know, everyone is muted and your video is disabled except for our, our panelists. So we can't see or hear you, but we know you're there. And so we really appreciate you all coming and spending your afternoon with us. We are recording this session and it's being uh, live streamed on our Facebook page and we will have a recording available later on our digital channels, on our website, YouTube, and Facebook. If you're having uh, technical issues, please utilize the chat function. I'm sure there's somebody who's um, on the webinar that they can probably assist you, um, and we will do our best to check in with that during the session as well. Uh, and so we are going to do the uh, presentation and then at the end open it up for questions and I will be moderating the questions from attendees. Um, so you can ask questions throughout the presentation using that uh, Q&A button and then I'll go back through those and um, ask our presenter at the end. You can also um, raise your hand or you can use a chat. I prefer if you use the Q&A function. Um, that's the easiest for us to, to moderate. And then I would also ask you all, if you all will take just a few minutes at the end of the session to complete a quick survey, um, it will pop up um, when you close out um, your browser uh, for the, uh, the session, a, a link will pop up. If you guys will just click on that, I'll take you to our survey. It's really helpful for us to understand you know, what's working well, where we can improve. And then if you all have ideas about, you know, what we might try for another session, we'd love to hear that as well. And then I wanted to just do a, a quick plug for our upcoming um, annual conference in October. So if you're enjoying our shelter series sessions, um, what we've tried to do with our virtual annual conference is really expand on that and bring you the same great content um, but over over two days. So we'll have a lot of um, really good sessions. Uh, in particular, I wanted to highlight a session that we'll be hosting with um, Richard Rothstein. Um, he's an author and he's going to be discussing his book, The Color of Law, A Forgotten History of How Our Government Segregated America. So I think that'll be really um, important and special session. And you can, in fact, just register for that particular session if your schedule only allows you to um, attend a small portion um, of the conference, but we'd love for you to see you guys um, over those two days. If you have any uh, questions or want more on our agenda for the conference, you can um, visit our website at presency.org uh, backslash conference. 
Um, and down here at the bottom are the, um, the uh, buttons that you all should have um, as attendees that you can utilize for questions and chat. Uh, and I think that's it. And I am going to uh, turn it over to Travis. All right. Well, thank you so much uh, for inviting me to share uh, the story of Bald Head Island with you all this afternoon. I'm gonna share my screen here. I knew I could do it. I'm not the best with technology. Uh, <laughs> so again, my name is Travis Gilbert. I'm the educator and collections coordinator here at the Old Baldy Foundation. And we are a non-for-profit organization founded in the year 1985 to preserve North Carolina's oldest standing lighthouse as a museum and a historic site interpreting not only the history of Bald Head Island, but also the maritime history of the entire Lower Cape Fear uh, region. Uh, I'm going to describe to you how our foundation preserves four centuries of shelter, how Bald Head Island has provided shelter through two methods or ways. And the antagonists that are going to be driving this theme of Bald Head Island being shelter are the Cape Fear River and Cape Fear, the headland one of three capes located along the coastline of North Carolina. Now you can see there on the map, the Cape Fear River is on the western border of Bald Head Island. And what is essential to know about the Cape Fear River is that it's the only major river in the entire state of North Carolina that flows directly into the Atlantic Ocean. Nearly every other major river in this state flows into a sound, most notably the Pamlico or the Albemarle Sound. And those sound waters are blocked from reaching the Atlantic Ocean by a series of barrier islands we North Carolinians know today as the Outer Banks. And there are very few inlets that cut through those barrier islands, the Outer Banks, in order to allow that sound water to go into the ocean and vice versa. So with the Cape Fear River being the only major river in the state that has access or direct access to the Atlantic Ocean, it made the Port of Wilmington nearly 30 miles upstream, north of Bald Head Island, the state's principal deep water port throughout much of North Carolina's history as a colony and later a state. Now the other antagonist to the story of Bald Head Island is on the eastern end of Bald Head Island. Number two there on the map, it is Cape Fear. Now, no one is for certain how Cape Fear got its name. One of the first instances of Cape Fear being named in the historical record takes us back to the 1580s, when Sir Richard Grenville almost wrecked out on that cape and uh, signified that cape as Cape of Fear. Now, as a reminder, a rough definition of a cape is a piece of the coastline that sticks way out into the ocean or roughly any body of water. And we have three capes here in North Carolina. We have Cape Hatteras in our north, Cape Lookout in the middle, and Cape Fear down here to the south. Now, extending off of the tip of each of those three capes in North Carolina, is a sandbar known as a shoal. At Cape Fear, we have the notorious frying pan shoals that extend 20, 25 miles from the tip of Cape Fear out into the Atlantic Ocean. Cape Lookout has lookout shoals and Cape Hatteras has diamond shoals. And frying pan shoals and its sister shoals act as a giant net or a wall waiting to trap and run aground any ships that don't go out and around the shoals through safe waters. This is how Cape Fear to Cape Hatteras, that roughly 200 miles of coastline, receives the notorious nickname of Graveyard of the Atlantic. It's a term coined by the renowned coastal historian David Stick 
And it gets its name from this idea that there are no less than 2,000 shipwrecks between Cape Fear on Bald Head Island to Cape Hatteras in our north. So Bald Head Island is shelter because the Cape Fear River's embrace sheltered mariners for centuries. And when those mariners ran into danger or trouble on frying pan shoals, the first landmass to provide shelter was Bald Head Island. And I encourage you all after hearing this story to come visit Bald Head Island. Ethel Herring, who was a late, mid to late 20th century historian in the Lower Cape Fear, said it best that Bald Head Island cannot be described. It must be experienced. I'm gonna do my best to describe it today, but come on down and experience it. So one of the first historical moments or stories that we enjoy speaking of here on Bald Head Island actually has its anniversary just this past weekend. It's called the Battle of the Sandbars. Uh, our most famous pirate on Bald Head Island in the Lower Cape Fear isn't Blackbeard, but rather one of Blackbeard's partners in crime. His name is Steed Bonnet, and that's a depiction of Steed Bonnet from this book written in the 1720s called A General History of Pirates. It was written by a pseudonym, a Captain Charles Johnson. Uh, historians have uh, various ideas or hypotheses on who Charles Johnson was. My favorite is Nathaniel Miss. He was a London newspaper editor. Uh, but this book and Nathaniel Miss uh, was kind of like a tabloid of its day. You have to take everything that Nathaniel Miss or Charles Johnson says in this book, A General History of Pirates, with a grain of salt. And one of the most um, kind of universal ideas that come from this book about Steve Bonnet show us how much you need to take these thoughts with a grain of salt. From this book, it's this idea that Steve Bonnet was a Barbadian planter, a sugar plant planter down in Barbados in the Caribbean. He had a wife, he had several children. He even served uh, at least officially as a militia in the Barbadian, uh, as a major in the Barbadian militia. And for some reason or another in 1716, he outfits a sloop called Rural James, sets off on the high seas and becomes a pirate. And the jury's still out on what on earth would make this man forsake that lifestyle. And according to a general history of pirates, he was trying to escape a nagging wife. Now, in 1720s, that makes for a good belly laugh. Uh, in 2020, I'd like to think that we aren't as sexist. And uh, as for an idea, what was the real reason that Steve Bonnet was escaping his life in Barbados? I'm not sure. There is a historian out of the North Carolina Maritime Museums that suggests he was escaping some debt, uh, debt collectors, uh, perhaps. I'll invite you to research and come up with your own theory. But regardless, he spends about two years being a pirate. And eventually he was going to meet Blackbeard in Nassau, in the Bahamas. And they are going to form a partnership that colors the rest of their lives. This partnership is going to take them to May of 1718 off the coast of Charlestown, South Carolina, today Charleston, where they will blockade that port. And the next month, they're trying to enter what we consider today Beaufort Inlet. Steve Bonnet would have known that inlet as Old Topsail Inlet, just north of us here on Baldhead Island. Well, it's when they're trying to get into Beaufort Inlet that Blackbeard accidentally runs their flagship, the Queen Anne's Revenge, aground on a sandbar. The next pirate ship, called the Adventure, comes in to help rescue the Queen Anne's Revenge, and it runs aground. Now, two of the pirate ships amongst this fleet are aground, and these are wanted men. Steve Bonnet decides to abandon Blackbeard, abandon Old Topsail Inlet, and work his way through the inland waterways of North Carolina to Bath, Bath, North Carolina where our proprietary governor, Charles Eden, lives. And Steve Bonnet asked Charles Eden for a pardon. Please forgive me of my piracy. 
Steve Bonnet retraces his steps, parted in hand, back to Old Topsail Inlet, expecting to find Blackbeard, but Blackbeard's nowhere to be found. And Steve Bonnet very quickly realizes that Blackbeard didn't accidentally run his ship aground on a sandbar. He did it on purpose. And as soon as Steve Bonnet was out of eyesight, Blackbeard took off, taking all his favorite pirates, abandoning the not-so-favorite pirates, marooning them on a sandbar outside of today, Beaufort, North Carolina. Steve Bond is going to seek some revenge, right? And his revenge will take him into the mouth of the Cape Fear River in August of 1718. He doesn't find revenge in the Cape Fear River, but he finds a great place, a shelter, to wait out hurricane season. It's just as Steve Bond is ready to leave in the waning days of September of 1718 that two ships appear out on the horizon of the Atlantic Ocean. They're the Sea Nymph and the Henry. They're under the command of Colonel William Rett, and they're from Charlestown, South Carolina. And they have not forgotten what Steve Bonnet did to their city just a few months prior. So history will forever know it as the Battle of the Sandbars, just offshore of Bald Head Island on September 26 and 27, 1718, because both the pirate hunters and the pirates accidentally run their ships aground on sandbars. So all five to six hours of this battle are fought with both ships stuck in the sand, unable to move, duking it out one another, resorting to fire, a small arms fire, and it's the tides that get the better of Steve Bonnet. He's further upstream when he gets stuck on a sandbar, so the tide that comes into the river refloats the pirate hunters first. They go in and capture Steve Bonnet and his entire crew, put him on trial in Charlestown through all the autumn of 1718, and of course, he is found guilty and hanged in downtown Charleston in early December, 1718. His buddy Blackbeard met a very similar fate at the hands of some Virginians up in Ocracoke, North Carolina. So for historians, each of these pirates' deaths in the autumn of 1718 end what we call the golden age of piracy, or at least it's the beginning of the end of the golden age of piracy. So this tale of Steve Bonnet shows us how difficult it is to navigate the Cape Fear River, even if it is a deep water port and a shelter. So some of the first acts or pieces of legislation pertaining to the lower Cape Fear help regulate pilots. These individuals with knowledge of the local waterways accumulated from years of fishing and sailing these waters in order to help assist these vessels navigate the Cape Fear River and reach the Port of Wilmington. They're some of the first individuals to hang out on the bald head, a head being a synonym for a hill, and the hill or head on bald head being barren or lacking trees. So bald head is a synonym for a barren hill, and it was this barren hill or bald head that the river pilots are looking out upon, waiting for these ships to appear onto the horizon and guide those ships into the growing ports of Brunswick Town first, and then Wilmington later. But of course, the river pilots are going to ask for a lighthouse to be built. And Old Baldy is not the first lighthouse constructed on Bald Head Island. There is a lighthouse that predates Old Baldy. It was started by the state of North Carolina and finished by the federal government was built by a New London, Connecticut man named Abishai Woodward, it was constructed of brick, tens of thousands of bricks imported from Philadelphia. The lantern room is forged by Samuel Wheeler in Philadelphia as well and shipped the whole way down here. By 1794, the federal government has themselves a lighthouse. It's the first lighthouse in the state of North Carolina, one of the first in the nation, it is the tallest lighthouse in the nation at the time of its construction. But the federal government made a mistake. They built that first lighthouse too close to the ocean. And by 1813, it was decided that the ocean was encroaching so much upon that lighthouse that it would be best to deconstruct North Carolina's first lighthouse brick by brick recycle the bricks, 
and recycle the lantern room and use those materials to build what we know as Old Baldy today. So that photograph on the left shows us in a roundabout way where the original lighthouse was located on Baldhead Island. To the left of those rocks, on the left-hand side of the photograph, is the Cape Fear River, and on the right, that water is the Atlantic Ocean. This is the point where the Cape Fear River is emptying into the Atlantic Ocean. Realistically, the site of that original lighthouse is now offshore, behind the photographer's perspective in that photograph. And one of the only likenesses we have of that original lighthouse, North Carolina's oldest lighthouse, is through a drawing from 1806, a pen and ink drawing that depicts a water spout in the mouth of the Cape Fear River. And that is the illustration here on our right, and that is one of the prized possessions within the collections of the Old Baldy Foundation. So Old Baldy is a lighthouse within a lighthouse. She's built of recycled material. And that is why we consider her construction in 1817 North Carolina's oldest standing lighthouse, not North Carolina's oldest lighthouse. Now, if you chip away at that stucco, which I say is a fancy word for concrete, you would see that recycled brick from the original lighthouse. It was constructed by Daniel Way, who was also from New London, Connecticut. And its history or its record as a harbor light welcoming mariners into the shelter of the Cape Fear River is not a straight linear path. She was in operation from 1817 until the American Civil War broke out in 1861 when the Confederate or Southerners deactivated that lighthouse so its light could not be used against the enemy warships, the Union Navy that were beginning to blockade the Lower Cape Fear region. The Confederates did deact or reactivate the lighthouse in the late years of the Civil War. And then after the Civil War concluded, there was a time when Old Baldy was not in service. She was not reestablished until the year 1880. And the secret is she wasn't even a lighthouse in 1880. She was a rear range light. She was a light in the behind. There was a light on a stake in front of Old Baldy on the beach. And when Old Baldy's light was directly in front or directly atop the light on a stake on the beach, you were in the correct position to reach that shelter of the Cape Fear River. If the lights were to the left or the right of one another, you were not in the correct angle to be within the river channel, and you may run aground, not ever reaching that shelter. So Old Baldy ended her career as a range light and not officially or technically a lighthouse. And she has not been in use since 1935. She is the only lighthouse in the state of North Carolina of the seven famous lighthouses that have no official purpose. She serves not as a navigational aid, but as a historic site and a resource in educating our community about the Lower Cape Fear region's maritime history. Now there's also some great military history on Baldhead Island. Not only is Baldhead Island a shelter for mariners seeking to embrace the Cape Fear River, it also provides shelter for British troops during the American Revolution. When our rural governor at the time, Governor Martin, fled Tryon's Palace today in Newburn, North Carolina, he sought shelter aboard a British warship anchored in the mouth of the Cape Fear River. And it is from that shelter in the Cape Fear River, just offshore of Baldhead Island, that he is writing British officials uh, back home in England for help. He says that this area, especially the lower Cape Fear River Valley, is rife with loyalists. These North Carolinians that decide to remain loyal to the King of England. And they're organizing themselves in modern day Fayetteville, North Carolina. They knew it as Cross Creek. So if these loyalists, these North Carolinians, could march down the Cape Fear River and rendezvous with British regulars imported from across the ocean, they could launch a successful invasion of North Carolina and reinstill the King's banner in this rebellious colony. Well, unfortunately, those North Carolinian loyalists marching down the Cape Fear River were defeated at the Battle of Moores Creek in Pender County, North Carolina today. 
But the British regulars, the reinforcements, did arrive, albeit not in time, and they arrived in the spring of 1776. Some were from North America, and others, under General Charles Cornwallis, traveled across the Atlantic Ocean from Ireland. They were attacked by the 4th North Carolina Continental Troops while stationed here on Bald Head Island. And the most we know about the British occupation of Bald Head comes from material remains that were left behind. One of my favorite pieces in our collections here at the Old Baldy Foundation is an officer's button that was dropped somewhere around the lighthouse and uncovered by archaeologists in 1986. Now, after September of 1776, the British abandoned Bald Head Island, abandoned their small fort they had constructed here, known as Fort George, and they would never return. But just as their British forefathers had done, the Confederates or Southerners are going to fortify this island as well. And they're going to create a much larger fort than the British had done. In fact, they're going to create a 1.7 mile long earthen wall christened as Fort Holmes. Fort Holmes' purpose was to keep the Port of Wilmington open to blockade runners. These short, shallow ships that have a draft of roughly 10 feet, they use sail power in addition to steam power fueled by coal, and the entire blockade running ship is painted blue or gray to blend into the surf and blend into the horizon. And these blockade runners will load up in Wilmington with raw agricultural goods that abounded in the American South. And they would export those raw agricultural goods, cotton, let's say, to either the Bahamas or, the, or Bermuda, where they would offload those agricultural goods onto larger ocean-bearing ships. Those ocean-bearing ships would take the goods to Europe, trade them for war materials that were in desperate need here in the American South. Once again, those ocean-bearing vessels full of guns and ammunition and tents and uniforms would come back into the Bermuda or the Bahamas, back onto the blockade runners who would make a dash for the Port of Wilmington. The Port of Wilmington is so essential to feeding, supplying, clothing the Confederate armies that General Robert E. Lee is going to write, if Wilmington falls, I cannot maintain my armies. So naturally, the South is going to fortify this island at the mouth or estuary of that essential deep water river and deep water port. So they create this 1.7 mile long earthen wall called Fort Holmes with five batteries or areas where there are cannons. Today, you may be familiar with Fort Fisher, Fort Anderson, full state historic sites in Brunswick and New Hanover counties that have wonderful rebuilt and preserved earthen walls. Unfortunately, our walls here at Fort Holmes were severely eroded throughout the late 19th and early 20th century. But the Old Baldy Foundation does preserve an interpreted trail, a roughly quarter mile stretch of earthen mounds and magazines, these man-made caves the Confederates constructed in order to store their ammunition. We preserve those mounds and a trail to interpret that history of the American Civil War. Now sheltering within this fort are about 1,200 troops in the 40th North Carolina Infantry and 3rd North Carolina Heavy Artillery. They're dual trained between artillery and infantry tactics. These soldiers' enemies were not the Union sailors offshore aboard the United States Navy warships attempting to prevent these blockade runners exiting the river with cotton and entering with guns. No, their enemy was not these sailors, it's Bald Head Island. This is not a great shelter. They get bit by mosquitoes and die from yellow fever and typhoid and malaria. They drink the poor water supply and have a poor diet. They die from dysentery or diarrhea. So many Confederate soldiers and their enslaved workers who are constructing these earthen walls of Fort Holmes die from disease on this island there's a long history of uncovering the remains of Confederate soldiers and their enslaved workers. It has happened 
early in the 20th century. We have oral histories of lighthouse, lighthouse keeper's daughters uncovering skeletal remains. And it has happened as recently as February of 2010 here on Bald Head Island when three skeletal remains were uncovered accidentally on the golf course. Now, when the United States Navy finally came to capture Wilmington, they did not attack the soldiers dying of disease here on Bald Head. They attacked Fort Fisher, the most powerful of all the forts defending the lower Cape Fear River. And once Fort Fisher fell in mid-January of 1865, it rendered Bald Head Island and Fort Holmes behind enemy lines. So this island was evacuated by Southern troops after the fall of Fort Fisher. Now, the story of the Civil War does not end there. We know throughout the spring and summer of 1865, once Wilmington falls, or some might say liberated by Union troops, Bald Island is used as a refugee camp for newly emancipated enslaved peoples. They're brought over here down from Wilmington, where some historians estimate there are tens of thousands of newly freed refugees that are not local to southeastern North Carolina, but in fact had been following General Sherman's armies on his march through Georgia and across the Carolinas. When they reach Wilmington, Wilmington did not have the shelter it did not have the resources to house, to clothe, to feed so many destitute folks. So some of these free people were ferried to Bald Head Island, to Fort Anderson, and other places in the Lower Cape Fear, where they may begin assimilating themselves into this new life as a free person in Reconstruction America. That activity must wrap up around the summer of 1865, and then Mother Nature does what she does best. She begins eroding what is left of this fort, leaving only about a quarter mile preserved by the Old Baldy Foundation and the Bald Head Island Association today. Now, shortly after the Civil War, the government begins reclaiming its operations on Bald Head Island. And before, or right around the time that Old Baldy is relit, welcoming mariners into the embrace or shelter of the Cape Fear River, a life-saving station is constructed on Bald Head Island's East Beach, out on the Cape. The life-saving service, think of it as a precursor to the Coast Guard. The enlisted men called surfmen live here seasonally on a station right on the beach. The keeper, the officer in charge, just like the lighthouse service, uh, organizes their efforts. He's a permanent employee year-round. The men threw a lookout tower built onto the roof of their station and beach patrols on foot up and down the sand. Watch out over the graveyard of the Atlantic and Cape Fear and frying pan shoals for any shipwrecks. When they see a shipwreck, they have two options in order to respond. Plan A is to fire their Lyle gun, a small howitzer cannon. When the cannonball hits the wrecked vessel, also attached to the cannonball is a rope. The cannonball delivers one end of the rope to the shipwreck where a survivor unties the rope from the cannonball and ties it to one of the parts of the ship sticking out of the water the highest. Meanwhile, the other end of the rope is secured in this, by a stake in the sand on the beach by one of these surfmen. Once that is done, a breech's buoy is attached to a pulley and the pulley is attached to the rope. A breech's buoy being that typical life preserver, that donut-shaped, cork-filled life preserver we're all familiar with, except this one has a pair of pants sewed into the hole. The word for pants is breeches or breeches, like a hill is a head. And the pulley sends the breech's buoy out to the shipwreck. Some brave soul is the first person to climb into the pair of pants and hold on for dear life, because they are ziplining, rappelling down the rope, out over the shoals in the water, the whole way to the shore just like this painting by Winslow Lewis is depicting in the bottom left-hand corner. Now, that Lyle gun had a range of 700 yards, let's say. So plan B, and most times plan B is used, these men are launching their surf boats. These weigh over a thousand pounds or over 20 feet long. They are rowing these with oars by hand, no, motor mo no motorboats, miles to sea. Historian Kevin Duffus just wrote a great article about a rescue that occurred in 1893 
in the Coastal Review online. I encourage you to check it out on their website. He writes that wrote, they rode seven miles out to a shipwreck and then seven miles back through a hurricane to rescue these folks. Now, according to one historian's estimate, at Cape Fear Station, in that middle photograph, you can see the station there on the shoreline. The bottom right-hand photograph, that shows you what Cape Fear looks like today. It's wonderful how the waves crash against one another. East Beach to your right, going towards Carolina Beach. South Beach to the left in that photograph, reaching back towards the mouth of the river in Oak Island. But at that Cape, out of this station, one historian estimates at minimum they responded to 54 shipwrecks, saving 642 lives and doing that all with a zero casualty rate. It is incredible and a testament to their skill and their bravery. So we get it. The Cape and the Shoals are dangerous. And Old Baldy is a harbor light. You went towards Old Baldy because she represented the safety of the river. So in order to warn about the danger of the Cape and Frying Pan Shoals, a few decades after building the life-saving station, the federal government builds the third and final lighthouse on Baldhead Island, known as Cape Fear Light Station. Now, as these photographs depict, it's not your typical, typical brick and masonry lighthouse. This is a skeletal lighthouse. It's a skeletal structure, big wrought iron and steel structure. It's 150 feet tall, whereas Old Baldy is just over 100 feet tall. And again, it's a seacoast light. It's warning mariners to stay away from the shoals. Don't come towards me. Now, if you get trapped on the shoals, the life-saving service men will be there to give you shelter here on Baldhead. Now, unfortunately, this light operated until 1958 when the federal government completed Oak Island Lighthouse that you see today in the Lower Cape Fear. And once Oak Island Lighthouse was completed, the federal government did dynamite Cape Fear Light Station. The only articles or material remains that are preserved of the third and final lighthouse on Baldhead is the plaza you see in the upper left-hand corner with the pilings remaining behind. And fortunately, three beautiful keeper's cottages depicted on the bottom right, all constructed in 1903 and all preserved through the generosity of the Mitchell family. Those cottages are known as Captain Charlie Station because one man served for 30 years as principal keeper of Cape Fear Light Station. And his name was Charles Norton Swan. You see him depicted in the center. Everybody calls him by his nickname, Captain Charlie. And he has provided so much folklore and legend about Baldhead, I don't even know where to begin. First of all, through two wives, one passed away of tuberculosis. Uh, they had 11 children that they raised off and on on Baldhead Island. And 11 kids on this giant playground with nothing out here could find a lot of trouble. So Captain Charlie invented this mythological creature called a Yaho. Yaho lived in the scrub, had sharp fangs, eight little children when they stayed out too late past the sunset, and he made a plaster cast of its footprint just to reinforce the rule, get home before it gets dark. And that's what you see on the footprint to your left. Captain Charlie also tells us that the daughter of Aaron Burr, the third vice president of the United States, most famous for killing Alexander Hamilton, Theodosia Burr Alston, met her fate on frying pan shoals and was unfortunately buried in an unmarked grave somewhere here on Baldhead Island. So the legend of Theodosia Burr Alston, who disappeared in the winter of 1812, 1813, somewhere in the graveyard of the Atlantic, Baldhead Island has a version of that story. And she is our ghost. Everybody on Baldhead Island has experiences with Theodosia. Thanks, Captain Charlie. By the way, he is the man that flipped on the switch to turn on Oak Island's lighthouse for the very first time. Coast Guard gave him that honor in retirement. Now, when the Life Saving Service was decommissioned in 1915, the Coast Guard was born as the Life Saving Service and the Revenue Cutter Service being merged together. And a new Coast Guard station was constructed on Baldhead Island. Now, unfortunately, the station house on that left hand, or excuse me, the right hand photograph, the larger building, the station house burned to the ground 
by folks seeking shelter on Baldhead Island from a shipwreck in the late 60s. But fortunately for us, the boathouse that stored the rescue or surf boats for these Coast Guardsmen responding to shipwrecks survived. And it is today a private residence that you see in that modern photograph. In the circa 1941, 45 photograph it is that center building over the right hand shoulder of the young lady on that vehicle. And this Coast Guard station operated during World War II when that graveyard of the Atlantic became known as Torpedo Alley or Torpedo Junction. Nazi Germany attacked at least 96 Allied cargo ships and oil tankers off the coast of North Carolina. And to respond, the Coast Guard operated these mounted horse patrols on Bald Head and other barrier islands. Men like Jack Murphy in the upper left-hand corner would go up and down the beach on these horses, seeking to identify German Nazi, war or Nazi submarines, U-boats, off in the graveyard of the Atlantic, and race that horse back to Old Baldy that had been repurposed into a radio beacon. They'd radio to an air base and bring down a bomber to help bomb that German U-boat. That was the last time war visited Bald Head Island. And at this time, development starts coming. The first developer of Bald Head was Thomas Franklin Boyd. He bought the island in 1914, and he attempted to create what was happening at Carolina Beach and Reitzel Beach here on Bald Head. He created an inn or a pavilion, a dance hall, somewhat like Lumina. But unfortunately, due to unable to get folks over here, several hurricanes, and eventually the Great Depression, Thomas Franklin Boyd's dreams were shattered. But folks continued to come to Bald Head Island. They were attracted to the lure, the shelter of this place, to see the old Coast Guard station, to marvel at the shoals of frying pan, to climb Old Baldy Lighthouse or Cape Fear Light Station, or to enjoy a nice picnic on our pristine beaches. So as long as folks continued to come, developers tried to seek out the best of Bald Head by providing amenities for folks coming over here. And the second developer, Carolina Cape Fear Corporation, also goes bankrupt. Well-organized environmental activists coalesce to impede the efforts of Carolina Cape Fear Corporation in developing this island. And they seek success in impeding the ability for Carolina Cape Fear Corporation to construct a marina, thus rely, have reliable ferry service offered to this island. A protracted legal battle occurs and the compromise is reached the developer has to donate 9,000 acres of saltwater marsh on Bald Head Island to the state of North Carolina so it may be preserved and protected, a shelter for recreation and for the ecology of this island, leaving only about 3,000 acres to be developed. But unfortunately, it's too little too late. And in 1976, as a direct result of this legal battle, this company goes bankrupt. It reverts to Builders Investment Group. It's a, another corporation that uh, is owned by Walter Davis. He buys the island in 1979 and begins to grow the amenities. You can see him photographed in the center there, inaugurating the ferry service and the marina. It is under Walter Davis and the leadership of Jim Harrington, an employee or an investor of Walter Davis. That electricity is delivered to the island in 1981. The ferry is finished by 1982. And George Mitchell, the current developer, finds this island and purchases the island in 1983. George Mitchell was also in the oil industry, just like Walter Davis, and is most well known in the Houston, Texas area in which he is from, from developing the Woodlands, a planned community northwest of Houston, Texas. So it is Walter Davis and then George Mitchell that developed this island into what we know it today. And it is George Mitchell who we have to thank for the Old Baldy Foundation and the preservation of North Carolina's oldest standing lighthouse. His son, and most importantly, his daughter-in-law, Donna Ray Mitchell, found this non-for-profit that's going to take this derelict, 
falling apart lighthouse and preserve her for centuries to come. Phase one occurs in 1990 and focuses on the exterior of Old Baldy. Phase two occurs in 1992 and focuses on rebuilding the staircase so to facilitate safe climbs. And the work continues. In 2017, for her 200th birthday, Old Baldy received quite a birthday gift and she has a new copper seal on her roof, ending decades of water infiltration that was damaging our very precarious and very fragile 18th century brick and masonry inside. So today, the Old Baldy Foundation interprets the history of Baldhead Island. We facilitate safe climbs of North Carolina's oldest standing lighthouse and use that lighthouse as a vehicle to educate young and old alike about North Carolina's rich maritime history and the Lower Cape Fear and Port of Wilmington's contributions to that maritime history. We offer tours and parades, living history, archives camps, field trips, you name it, everything that we can do to instill a deep appreciation about this island's historical significance and that historical significance in terms of a national and statewide scale. So again, my name is Travis Gilbert. I'm the Educator and Collections Coordinator here at the Old Baldy Foundation. My email is there. My work cell is there. If you would like to visit Baldhead Island and continue this conversation, I have plenty more to share. I'd love to see you here on Baldhead Island and host you all. And I look forward to answering some questions here as we wrap up. Thanks so much, Travis. That was amazing. So real claps for me, virtual claps, I'm sure, um, out there on the on their interwebs. Um, so I'm going to open it up for questions for Travis now. And as I mentioned, what you can do at the bottom of your screen, they have to hover over the bottom. Um, there's a Q&A button. If you click on there, um, I can see what question you have or you can um, type in the chat, or you can um, raise your hand and I can unmute you and you can ask your question live. Um, see, we've got a couple comments. Thank you, Travis, for a very interesting presentation. Um, here we've got a question from um, Carol Locken Lockenman. I apologize, Carol, if I'm mispronouncing your name. Um, her question is, what does the future hold? What does the future hold for the Old Baldy Foundation? That's a great question. Um, unfortunately, uh, the lighthouse did uh, receive damage during Hurricane Florence, and it didn't get any better during Hurricanes Dorian or Isaias. So our development team is working on procuring grant monies in order to make us whole after those storms, and most importantly, make us even more resilient for future storms. Additionally, atop of Cape Fear Light Station was a massive Fresnel lens. Uh, this technology developed by a French physicist to refract or bend light onto the horizon and make lighthouses more effective. Well, when the lighthouse was destroyed, the Coast Guard allowed, or the government allowed the demolition crew to take that lens with them. This is a lens that had been on display at the Centennial Exposition in Philadelphia. It had been created in France in 1872. Uh, it's a renowned lens and wonderful work of art and a great piece of the nation's history. And the demolition crew ended up selling it to Labriola's Antiques. Some of you may be familiar if you're in the Wilmington area. It's along Oleander Drive, or was along Oleander Drive in Wilmington. And that antique dealer sold off bits and bits of this Fresnel lens. And in 2009, the Old Baldy Foundation was able to acquire what was left, including the pedestal. And our team of board members and volunteers and staff members have been working throughout the years to get back as much as we can of that Fresnel lens. 
we have lenses that are going to be willed to us, deeds of gifts, we've sold some. We need a facility large enough to display that lens once it's recreated. Currently, we do not have a facility large enough. This lens is feet upon feet tall, it's taller than I am. Um, so the future is making Old Baldy whole, making her more resilient for future storms, and creating a facility to display this beautiful work of art, an impressive piece of technology that helped warn mariners about frying pan shoals. Right now, it's safely stored away in our archival facility here on the island. Awesome. Thanks, Travis. Um, so we have a question from Robert Holtz. Uh, Travis, what percentage of the island is open for development? Also, is the land sold or long-term lease? Uh, so the land on Baldhead uh, was, was owned by Baldhead Island Limited LLC, and that is simplifying it. Um, there certainly was some deeds that were sold previous to 1983 uh, that, of course, the, the Mitchells and, and, and Bald Island LLC, uh, Limited LLC, had to abide by. Uh, but the developers who sold off the plots of land uh, to private owners. So today, there's only a few hundred lots yet left to be sold. We're actually working backwards from the cap because many lots have been donated to a Smith Island Land Trust. So I like to tell folks when you see the island today, this is about it. It's not going to get much larger than what you see today. And think about it, we began with the 12,000 square acres. Uh, now they donated, uh, they uh, gave to the state 9,000 of that saltwater marsh. And then Baldhead Island Limited LLC um, sold to the state of North Carolina over 200 acres in the middle of the island to create a maritime forest preserve at a very, very cheap rate. Uh, the state bought it using federal grant monies. Uh, so a significant portion of this island is already preserved. We're wrapping up what is left to be developed. But it's very important to remember that Baldhead Island is a city like Southport or Wilmington, uh, Oak Island. We have a mayor, we have a city council. They're all duly elected by folks, property owners, who choose to be registered to vote here on the island. That's how we come up with this magic number of roughly 150, give or take, permanent residents. It's the number of folks who are registered to vote on this island. So the developer's job is done. They've received a return on their investment and Baldhead Island is running and facilitating the trash, the water and sewer, just as any other city does, through municipal service that are taxpayer funded and directed by uh, elected officials. Awesome. Um... We have a question from Rodney Sweet. Uh, thanks, Travis. Very interesting. What are the next projects you have in mind? Yeah, um, I would love to get field trips back and started. <laughs> uh, we, we operate a scholarship fund called Lighthouse Learners, uh, where we solicit donations through fundraisers and private donors to um, get fourth graders over here for free and experience a day on Baldhead Island. The curriculum is based not only on social studies standards, but also we invite a partner, the Baldhead Island Conservancy, uh, whose mission is to interpret and preserve the natural resources of this island. They come over and do some stations for the fourth graders. So um, we're looking forward to uh, getting field trips back and started and rebuilding that fund so we can invite as many fourth graders over to this island to experience this island's history uh, on our dime for free. Um, additionally, we've been doing, uh, we've been working on uh, professionalizing our collections and digitizing our collections. Uh, slowly but surely, we have a majority of our collections pieces accessible on our website, oldbaldy.org. These are high resolution photographs of one of a kind artifacts. Uh, now, it just came to my attention that we have 
dozens of boxes sitting in a facility uh, in Raleigh uh, that is owned by the state. So when you are processing collections and professionalizing your collections procedures, I'm beginning to learn that's a job that's never done. And when you think you've learned it, you have way more to learn than you could possibly absorb in, in one little tenure. Um, so continuing that process to ensure that we are sharing our information, we are making our collections accessible to the public via anywhere, that this pandemic has certainly shown the importance of being able to access information from a little bit of anywhere. And most importantly, uh, professionalizing our procedures and our policies to ensure that these collections pieces are here for future generations long after I'm gone. They're protected from storms, they're protected from wear and tear. Uh, preventative care and preventative maintenance is um, the best way to invest in your collections. And that is what myself and my other team member, McCallie Givens, uh, is doing here at the Old Baldy Foundation. Uh, so that's, that's our, our way of looking forward, and that's how we're spending our time right now. Awesome. Um, we've got a question from Veronica Thomas. Uh, is it possible for groups to come to the island and spend the night and take tours? And should we contact Travis for that? Uh, absolutely. So there is a variety of ways that you can rent a home here on Bald Head Island. Uh, each have their different rules and um, availability and, uh, uh, you know, various procedures. Uh, I encourage you to uh, go onto Airbnb, go into VRBO or some of the property management companies that facilitate those rentals here on Bald Head Island. And uh, once you have your overnight stay booked, uh, please reach out, uh, and I would love to show you around the lighthouse and take you on our very successful tour program aboard a golf cart. It takes you all around the island and shows you so many sites that I've discussed uh, this afternoon. Uh, and even if you can't get an overnight stay, come on over for the day. Uh, it, it's just, just as great as the day, but I do have to admit, seeing the stars out here at night on the tip of Cape Fear, there's, there's nothing quite like it. <laughs> Oh, wow. That sounds amazing. Um, uh, we have a question from Charles Francis. Great presentation. Learned a lot about Ballhead. Can, can you share any more background on freedmen who were moved to the island when the Union liberated Fort Fisher and Wilmington? Um, and are there any resources on these ancestors? Um, absolutely. Uh, so my counterpart, McCallie Gibbons, uh, just identified a name, and I believe based on a conversation that actually occurred this afternoon, I believe two names um, from the uh, WPA interviews that occurred in the early 20th century. So she may have reached a breakthrough, uh, a breakthrough there. Uh, where the um, information that we, we gleaned from this comes from the official records of the Union uh, armies and navies. And it's several telegraphs coming from the headquarters uh, in Wilmington talking about ferrying these uh, contraband, is the word they use, uh, to Bald Head Island, uh, just trying to get them out of the city. Um, not only are there thousands of free people now in Wilmington, there are also thousands of federal prisoners of war that find themselves in Wilmington. Uh, one of the largest prisoner war exchanges of the American Civil War occurred in New Hanover County along the Northeast branch of the Cape Fear River. So Wilmington, who had a population right before the Civil War broke out of 9,500 some people, now we have thousands of freed people, thousands of former prisoners of war. These folks are not in the best health uh, the infrastructure in Wilmington to support these thousands of refugees does not exist. So it seems like through these telegraphs, uh, these telegrams, and through uh, the records in the, uh, in the uh, Union Army and Navy, that they're just trying to um, not condense these refugees as much, spread everybody out. So one particular region or area in the Lower Cape Fear is not facing the burden of these refugees. 
And since Bald Head Island had the infrastructure, it had a fort, it had shelter, it had defensible position, likely there were foodstuffs left behind by the Confederates, there was the infrastructure here to at least support some of these refugees before they could be assimilated into this life as a free person in Reconstruction America. So we're basing this information just on a few primary resources, again, from the official records of the Union and Army navies. Um, and uh, we're learning more. So to be continued is a great answer. And if anybody out there has any more information, uh, we would love to hear from you, uh, Travis at oldbaldy.org. Uh, you can help us advance our interpretation and increase our knowledge. Great. I, somebody had a, a similar question. Um, I think their question is more about um, advice on um, researching that themselves. And I think you mentioned the WPA resources and um, the Confederate and, and Union um, information. Do you know of a place where folks can go to access that themselves or, and if something to uh, Travis, if you want to, you know, email it to me or send it to me later, I can, you know, send it to the folks who are attending today. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, off the top of my head, I cannot recall where uh, we get those primary resources, but I know that they are digitized online in a variety of places. Uh, I think that most times it's facilitated through the um, archive, di the digitization efforts of various public universities. Uh, so that is something we can definitely follow up upon so folks can read these primary sources themselves. But if you do a quick Google search of uh, official records of the Union Army or the Union Navy uh, and eventually you know, delineate spring of 1865 and search for keywords like Wilmington or Bald Head Island, you're going to see some of these uh, um, official orders from the Union military leaders uh, ferrying these uh, freed people to various locations in the Lower Cape Fear. And the WPA is a great record too. Uh, that something is a little more tedious uh, that McCallie, who's a wonderful researcher and a great uh, co-worker uh, has, has been doing, uh, but it, it, it tends to be a little tedious. Gotcha. Um, so we have a question from uh, Catherine Koppel. What is the island's water source? Yes, so uh, since 1985, the water source is uh, a, a, from Oak Island. There is a, a pipe or several pipes that go underneath the river channel, underneath the Cape Fear River, just as the electric line that was laid in 1981 does. But I would let you know that uh, Hurricane For Florence forced me to learn about this uh, aquifer. We are on a giant water bubble just like Ocracocus. And there is nothing but fresh water right underneath this ground. And when you have a year like 2018, when we had a record amount of rain, and then a hurricane that dumps 30 inches of rain, that water table is going to be non-existent. And that's what happened here in Hurricane Florence. It wasn't salt water that breached the dunes and came in. It was fresh water, the aquifer, this giant freshwater bubble that we're sitting upon filled up to it couldn't take anymore. And the water just started seeping out of the ground and then Bald Head Island filled up like a tub. So previous to 1985, the water uh, sources were from that freshwater aquifer. But today they're modern, um, infrastructures put in place that again come from Oak Island or more specifically Caswell Beach. Okay, um, we have a question from um, Andrea Danchi. Travis, could you talk a little bit more about the resilience vision that you and the organization have for the island property? Is this concept, is this concept and design ongoing? Uh, definitely. I, I don't have too many details. Um, we are in the midst of uh, writing grant and in the midst of grant procurement. So to be sensitive to those efforts, uh, I kind of have to remain a little bit mum on our future plans. But I will elaborate on what has occurred and what our current um, you know, successes are. Is that the early 90s, Old Bali was never sealed. Uh, there is a, obviously a roof on Old Baldy and it lacked a copper cap. And it was not until a historian named Kevin Duffus 
in 2016, 2015, give or take a year, uh, he discovered that there was in fact a copper cap on top of Old Baldy's roof. And that is what eventually sealed the top of Old Baldy and eliminated once and for all this persistent problem of water making its way into the lantern room and then running down the interior of Old Baldy. We had mold, we had mildew growing on our brick inside, and now she is so watertight and so dry as the person that walked in Old Baldy for the first time after Hurricane Florence, I can testify to how sealed, sealed she is. So in terms of resiliency, we must maintain that ability for water to be shed away from the lighthouse and not enter or infiltrate the lighthouse. And now we have to work on being resilient with the spalling of the brick inside of Old Baldy. We're seeing significant amounts of spalling, and that is a consequence of Old Baldy being dry for the first time in hundreds of years, maybe since she was built in 1817. So we're working uh, with resiliency efforts to address that brick spalling inside. And that might be, it's never ending, but that might be at least in this um, track, in this program, a nice conclusion to our efforts since her 200th anniversary in 2017. So I encourage you to keep checking back to oldbaldy.org and our Facebook page and Instagram because I believe in the next few years, there's going to be a lot happening with resiliency efforts um, on that part. So thank you for that. That's a great question. All right. Thanks, Travis. So um, we, we've got two more questions and then we'll wrap it up. But I do want to mention somebody did ask to repeat um, your phone number and contact information. And I've put it in the chat. So um, Travis's um, email and phone number are uh, in the chat. Um, I'll just actually repeat it <laughs> if you're writing it down. It's uh, 910-448-1472, and it's Travis at oldbaldy.org. Um, and our last two questions, um, how did the turtle population fare this breeding season on the island? Um, they, um, they had some nesting that occurred before Hurricane Isaias. As with most of our barrier islands, uh, there was a significant amount of loss due to that storm surge. Uh, I will say last year, they had a record-breaking year of sea turtle nesting on this island. So I always think, and this is from somebody that doesn't have any experience with biology, but I almost got to wonder if Mother Nature is compensating, <laughs> knew what was going to happen this year, overcompensated last year. Um, I encourage you to go to the Bald Head Island Conservancy's website, uh, bhic.org, baldheadislandconservancy.org, and they will have some great information on the sea turtle nesting program and some of those uh, ecological concerns uh, and questions that you may have. Awesome, thanks Travis. I just put that in the chat as well. Um, and our last question is from Jim Strauss. Uh, Travis, are you still connected to the Wilmington Historical Society? Uh, with the, uh, so I serve on the board of directors of the uh, Historic Wilmington Foundation and uh, we just announced a new program where we're doing uh, walking tours, free walking tours that are socially distant and maintain uh, masks and, and all these uh, three W's uh, about Wilmington's architecture. Uh, and I encourage you to go to historicwilmington.org uh, to find information about those walking tours that I'm leading. Uh, so I'm very involved in the Historic Wilmington Foundation. I'm very proud of their staff and their executive director, Beth Rutledge, her leadership is phenomenal. And the historic, the irreplaceable in Wilmington is in good hands through the advocacy of that team. And it's my honor to serve on their board. And as for the Lower Cape Fear Historical Society, I do volunteer with that organization frequently, uh, including their annual candlelight tour at Christmas time. Uh, I'm looking forward, I know they have plans on doing a, a kind of a walking tour 
uh, this year, uh, and rather than going inside um, folks' homes in the historic district because of this pandemic. And uh, I love the Latimer House dearly, and they're next door neighbors to the Historic Wilmington Foundation. And there's a young lady named Jess there, uh, Jessie, who is, is running uh, the show. And uh, the Latimer House additionally is, is in great hands. It's great to see um, youth and energy uh, working behind the scenes to continue to interpret the history of the Lower Cape Fear and to preserve these structures that are a testament to that history. Awesome. Thanks so much, Travis. Um, again, we were thrilled to have you. Um, this was an awesome presentation. And I just want to encourage folks to do two things. One is to make sure and take that survey that pops up when I close out. And then I also want to, uh, again, invite everybody, if you've enjoyed um, this programming, to join us for our uh, virtual conference, uh, October 15th through the 16th. You can find more out about that at uh, presency.org uh, backslash conference. Um, we'll be doing a session, um, a cooking and history session with um, Dean Neff. So know some folks who are from the Wilmington area are familiar with him. Um, again, we'll be doing a keynote with Richard Rothstein, um, also with Brett Legs of the um, uh, the National Trust uh, African American Cultural Heritage Fund, um, talk about the successes of that. Um, and kind of new for us is a program um, called History on a Stick, the Politics of Public Memory. So we'll be talking about um, historical markers, uh, those um, big white signs that you see in front of um, historic locations across the state, just talking about that program and, and how that works. Um, so that'll be really interesting. So hope you all will join us um, and look forward to seeing you in October. And this is recorded and I'll have it available tomorrow. All right, take care. Bye, Travis. Take care, thank you.